show slides here on an old-fashioned projector. If I could find a lantern slide machine, I'd use that. Um, I, I acknowledge the, uh, the reality of technology in our lives today, but I don't like it, you know. Um, anyway, that's, that's my problem and not yours. That's probably why I have spent the last 40 or 50 years of my life uh, living in the past and, and, and writing about it. And some of you probably know those books. Uh, what I'll show you today in uh, the time that I am allotted um, will bring you back to uh, the early days of, of the water business in, uh, in this part of the world, in the Shokan, where, uh, as uh, Supervisor Stanley pointed out, uh, the city of New York came and, and took the land by eminent domain and produced a reservoir of... Uh, you know, some 24 square miles and about 130 billion gallons of water. Um, I've been interested in the technological part of it to some extent, and that's a technology, I guess, which is closer to me than, than contemporary technology. But primarily, uh, as interesting and gripping as that is, and there's some wonderful experts on it, I'll probably mention their names and the books they've written, What's interested me the most is the stories of the people who've been involved, those whose land was taken, uh, and those who came and uh, took the land. Very, very interesting people. So you'll get to see some of them, some images of them, and, uh, and hear a little bit about what happened roughly from uh, the last decade of the 19th century until 1918 when the project was uh, completely finished, although the dam closed in September of 1913. Um, my wife and I, as a matter of fact, back in um, 2013, at, uh, at the exact time that the, the dam was finally closed and the water began to rise, uh, we went out on the dam and, and looked at the reservoir at that time. That was, you know, a year, year and a half ago or so, and it, it was interesting for me. Uh, I felt very moved by it because I had had lived with this story for so many years, and written about it, and given so many talks on it. And I was amazed to see that there was nobody else there. Somehow I thought that 100 years later to the second, we you know, held the watch up and looked at it, because it, it was closed late in the day, almost dark. I, I thought the place would be filled with all of us, you know, you know to, to either celebrate that or to bemoan that experience. But it wasn't. It was just a very beautiful, quiet afternoon, and that was it. Anyway, uh, I think you'll be interested in some of the images that I have to show you, and uh, if we have time, I'll answer some questions, but I'm not sure what the schedule is other than uh, I have about an hour, so uh, here we go. The story of uh, the Ashokan Reservoir begins not in Ashokan, of course, but in New York City, where um, from the very earliest days, and we're talking uh, late 17th, early 18th century, before the American Revolution, um, New York City had what was called at that time a, a water problem, a water famine. Um, they just never seemed to have enough water, and what water they had was uh, not always uh, potable. So just prior to the American Revolution, they, uh, they called upon their first scientist. He was a man, interesting chap, named Christopher Collis, who was an Englishman. As, as everyone was, I guess, at that time. And uh, they sent for him, and he came over on a ship, and uh, he assessed the problem and, and decided what could be done. But then the revolution came, and uh, Christopher had to retreat. So he never really got to do what, uh, what he told New York they needed to do as far as getting uh, an adequate supply of potable water. Uh, after that time, as you can see from this image, in the early 19th century, uh, after the revolution, uh, a number of companies, like the Manhattan Company, that was one of many, they got together and they built uh, individual reservoirs, and this was one that was on the site of what later on became the New York Public Library. But clearly they were, they were inadequate. And so by the latter part of the 19th century, uh, New York was in pretty bad straits. And the governor at that time, who's the chap on the left with a smile on his face talking to uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who at that time was governor of New York State, Governor Roosevelt, 
um, he really uh, uh, provided the vanguard and the push and so on, and uh, studies were done. Uh, he, he, he was supported in his efforts by uh, Governor Roosevelt. And they um, put together a committee. You can see some of the chaps on the committee. Their names were like Burr and Herring and Freeman, a chap in the upper left who did the study. Uh, extensive studies were done. And it was determined that although um, it was possible that water might be gotten from the Adirondacks or maybe again from Westchester or Putnam County, which had already been tapped, uh, different places downstate, New Jersey and so on, even the Hudson River was talked about, although I'm not sure they had the technology to, uh, to clean it up at that time. But it was determined by the studies that were done that um, the best place to build the dam and the reservoir was up in uh, what today is the town of Olive and Hurley, Woodstock, and so on. And, um, and so they hired a, uh, a, a general manager, a chief engineer, as he was called. Later on, he was called the uh, Catskill Water Man. And here he is uh, center on with the, uh, the lighter colored clothing. He was very dapper. His name was J. Waldo Smith. And you've probably seen, um, if you've gone over by the dam to the north of it, there's a tower there that was used as a triangulation tower and later on as a, a water tower and so on. And he, there's a plaque to him there. He was an interesting man. He was from Lincoln, Massachusetts. At the time, uh, this photograph was taken, and he began his duties as chief engineer. That is, he was in charge of everything, from the building of the dam in Ashokan to the, the tunnels, the, the aqueduct, right down to New York City. He was 44 years old. Uh, he would live until 1933 in his early 70s, but at, at this time, he was 44 years old. Uh, he, he was an Ivy Leaguer. He had gone to MIT, he had an engineering degree. He had worked in, in the water systems of his hometown since he was about 15 years old. He had, he had built later on the, uh, the New Croton Dam, a highly experienced man. And um, he, he was paid $15,000 to oversee the project, which took roughly about uh, 10 or 12 years overall. J. Waldo Smith, the Catskill water man. He looks like um, my high school history teacher, Arthur Kurtznacker. And maybe that's why I'm, uh, I'm so fond of him. But he, he was a man that was well-loved, uh, even by the locals, which is surprising in some ways. And uh, they said that he could, he could pick the right piece of people for the right job, and he could, um, he could work with them with tact and, and skill. And apparently, uh, apparently he did. Well, once they decided where the reservoir was going to be, it was a fait accompli that it would happen. But uh, they did hold hearings, which is interesting. Uh, the, the newspaper coverage of the hearings are quite fascinating. And the hearings were held, some five, six, seven, eight hearings, they were held in Kingston and in New York City. And uh, people were given the opportunity to speak out against the project if they thought it wasn't a good idea. And uh, you can imagine how many people thought it wasn't a good idea who lived up here. And two of the more prominent ones were this chap here, whose name was A.T. Clearwater. Clearwater was a prominent Republican citizen and attorney. Later on, he would represent many of the claimants. But he spoke up about uh, the, the menace that the, the dam would uh, provide for, for Kingston, Saugerties, and all of, the, uh, all of the cities below on the Esopus Creek, which was dammed. Uh, and that was no idle, uh, idle uh, claim People had seen what happened in Johnstown when, uh, when the dam was not taken care of and so on. Um, Clearwater was an interesting chap, uh, a very, very fine speaker, and uh, probably one of the four or five most prominent people in the county. Um, the second person among hundreds that spoke was probably the wealthiest person and the most prominent and wealthy and powerful person in Kingston and Ulster County at the time, and his name was Samuel Decker Kirkendall. Those of you that uh, are railroad buffs will know him because he was the owner of uh, many, many uh, big businesses and quarries and so on, but he was also the owner of the Ulster and Delaware Railroad. And 11 miles of track went through where the reservoir would uh, be constructed, and he didn't think that was a good idea. Um, he also commented on the um, boarding house industry, which would be destroyed. And of course, he was, uh, he was right. 
But of course, even these citizens speaking out uh, were overridden. And uh, the state did approve the project, and it went ahead. But one of the things that's very interesting for, uh, for people who lived in this area is to note that even though the project was, um, was found to be acceptable, it was approved in the spring of uh, 1906, the, the, the hearings were that previous uh, fall and winter, the work had already begun before the state approved the project. And that has left uh, a very bad taste in the, uh, in the minds of, uh, of people at that time. They, they were doing core borings to find where the dam was going to be. Originally, it was thought that the dam would be somewhere about where we are now, or even further down the uh, Esopus Gorge. But they found that they couldn't reach uh, bedrock. So ultimately, they decided that the dam would be uh, upstream where it is now in, uh, in Olive Bridge. They also began surveying properties before they had approval to do so. Uh, these surveyors were made up of some locals, but mainly individuals from out of the area. And, uh, and again, bad feeling in that respect, because not only were they doing it before they had permission to do it, but also they were uh, opening gates and not closing them and leaving animals out and cutting down rose bushes and you know things of that sort. They survived, uh, surveyed the area, which is oh, some 24 square miles, about 15,000 acres that the city took. They squared that, uh, surveyed that into some 18 sections. Uh, section number one is uh, up near the corner of uh, Route 28A and, uh, and the old Linder property there where, where the Sampsonville Road comes down. They also set up a measuring weir to determine, uh, once again, although the, the original Burr, Herring, uh, Freeman study had determined that there was more than adequate water, but they did that again to see if they could be sure of how much water there was. And of course, it was adequate. And then, of course, the surveyors drew what has been drawn on this photograph. This is looking uh, from, oh, roughly uh, where the gatehouses are uh, over towards um, Torrens Hook and Tanchi Mountain and so on, where Route 28 is. Uh, they drew what was called the take line. And if your property, and there were 954 pieces of property, some 500 houses, about 1,500 outbuildings, barns, and so on, if your property was within the take line, uh, it, it had to go. It, it was taken by the city of New York. And they could do so upon notification, which was done primarily uh, in the post office on the wall, uh, if they notified you and said uh, they were taking your land, they could take it within 10 days after um, uh, uh, putting a bond down or paying in, in putting to escrow um, one half of the assessed valuation of that property. And most uh, small farms, average houses, and so on, the assessed valuation was about four or five hundred dollars. Now, that didn't mean that the people got that money. That was in escrow, and many of them, it was years before they got the money. But that's all the city had to do. So it meant that uh, families like Bells and Scheringers and, and, and Scherters and all these old names around this part of the world, Winchells and so on, um, they had to move. Uh, and it was um, a tough experience for them, as you imagine. Uh, when I did the research for the book years ago, I thought I would found, find a lot more people who said, well, I'm glad to go. Uh, we, you know, we don't like our farm and we're sick of it and we don't get t good TV reception or whatever it is. Uh, but that was not the case. Of the hundreds of people I interviewed, there were very, very few who said it was acceptable to them. But of course, they were expected to do it. Uh, during the hearings, the Corporation Council for the City of New York, a man named Delaney, when asked about the locals, said, um, well, you know, these communities, these rural communities just have to be sacrificed to the needs of the great city. And then all the, uh, all the newspapers of the day, the world in New York and so on, uh, individuals who lived in the towns were called Rubens of the First Order. That was a, f a familiar phrase. Well, that meant rednecks. And Ulster County and the area of Ashokan, as it later on became known, was called Aboriginal Ulster. Uh, many people uh, are not aware of the fact that there was very little sympathy 
for the people who were um, who were moved, and the general feeling, which which is established and was presented over and over again in New York Times, was that really all these people were doing was uh, trying to establish a case so that they could get more money from the city of New York. Um, it's not to say that might not have happened from time to time, but these are families who had lived here for four and five and six generations. This area was settled, as you probably know, in 1740. So it had an old community. Uh, depending on what you think of as a village or a hamlet, about uh, anywhere between eight and 12, I like to think of 10, but eight and 12 villages and hamlets were taken uh, by the city. And uh, some of the more prominent ones, I thought you might uh, find it interesting to see what they looked like if you haven't seen them before. This was Old West Hurley. This was a photograph taken by Liner Delisier in, uh, in 1896 of Old West Hurley. So it was roughly about six years or ten years before the project started. There's Lane's Hotel with the, with the uh, balcony on it and so on and the old church, Methodist Church. And, that sort of thing. West Hurley was probably the largest village in what was called the East or Lower Basin of the uh, Shokan Reservoir. In the Upper Basin, uh, the West Basin, one of the more prominent communities was Broadheads Bridge. That's where the Ulster and Delaware Railroad, owned by Kirkendall, went across the Esopus Creek and uh, onto West Shokan and so on. And we still have a Broadheads Bridge, but like most of the towns, uh, that did survive, they just simply moved up on the rim and, uh, you know, some people stayed and some did not. In Brown Station also, uh, I mean, excuse me, in uh, Broadheads Bridge also, um, probably the largest boarding house in the, uh, in the area, in the basin, existed. It was called the Willowbrook. It was up above what today is called um, Bridal Vale Falls. When the reservoir is full, Bridal Vale Falls is only about a couple feet high but it was much higher than that. You probably know that the reservoir is about three, one to three miles wide. The deepest place out from the dam is about 180, 190 feet, and the general depth is probably 40 or 50 feet deep, one, uh, one full. And the last village, uh, probably the largest of, uh, of all of the villages within the uh, reservoir, some 10 or so that were taken, was West Shokan. This is West Shokan. Uh, there's the Pythian Hall down down the road, and of course the Hamilton House, which was um, the best hotel, I guess you would say. And it's interesting that the the engineers who came here, many of them from the South, brought up by uh, James Winston, who you'll meet in a few minutes, uh, they stayed at the Hamilton House. And uh, during the years of the construction of the reservoir, from oh about uh, 1907 or eight until. Uh, the dam was finished and the whole project maybe 10 years later. Um, th these villages did pretty well. My favorite though, the last one of, uh, of all villages, and this photograph was taken in the 1890s too, again only about 10 years before it disappeared forever, was Olive City. Olive City is, uh, has not come back, it's not been resuscitated, but it was a wonderful little center, a rural center where uh, um, basically, uh, the people who lived there were farmers and so on. Uh, the city of New York gave the average farmer about four to five thousand dollars for his or her farm. Uh, acreage probably probably from two hundred to three hundred dollars an acre, that sort of thing. I've always loved this village. This village is close to where the dam is today. It would have been out beyond the dam and beyond the falls, Bishop's Falls that you'll see in a minute. It's a wonderful snow shot. But I, I'm particularly attracted to this because one of the individuals that I interviewed, whom you will see at the end of the talk, a man named Harlan McLean, lived in that village and uh, as a young man worked for Rice, who was the contractor who cleared all of the territory, cut down everything, got rid of all the houses and that sort of thing. And, uh, and Harlow actually burned his own house down. Many of the houses were rented until that time. Well, contract three, which is the big contract, and there were hundreds of contracts, uh, contract three was for the main dam and the dikes that uh, you know, cr created the reservoir. And that contract was let out in um, 1907 to a company that we'll talk about in a minute. 
and uh, by 1908, the first, uh, the fall of 1908, the first um, masonry was laid at the dam. But here, here's the contractors coming in. This is the Winston and Company contractor with all these great steamrollers and high tech, you know, stuff like that, that moved into the territory. Where the dam was built um, is just uh, about where we are now, roughly standing, you know, in, in this photograph. It's, it's an old uh, uh, postcard, as you can see. The bridge that's there was the original Olive Bridge. Um, it was, as you can see, a covered bridge and of some magnitude, some size, and above it, to the west, we're looking west towards Boyceville, in the upper, what would become the upper basin, was the so-called Bishop's Falls. And it had uh, mills there for years going, going back into the, into the 1700s. This, of course, is all underwater now. It's been underwater since September 1913. But some years ago, I gave a talk of this sort and used this slide, and a woman came up later on. She was younger than I. And she said, I know that place. I've been there. I've been there. And I said, well, you might have, you know, if you're a scuba diver. Um, and she didn't laugh, and she said, no, I'm sure. I said, well, go home and look through your scrapbook and see if you've ever seen a picture of it. And she did, and she called me sometime later on, and she said, yes, I've seen the postcard, but I saw it so many times, my grandmother showed it to me, and they had been moved and so on. And uh, she said, that's, that made me think that I had been there before. But of course, that's all gone. The first thing they had to do, and this began in uh, the summer of 1907 when the contract was let, and, and by the way, Winston and Company, it was originally MacArthur Brothers, Winston and Company, but Winston brought MacArthur, brought MacArthur out and, and they did the project themselves. But um, in 1907 when they started on this, the first thing they had to do was get down to bedrock, which of course they couldn't have done downstream. We talked about that. They put two coffer dams in and they ran a big pipe that you can see in the upper right hand side, about 12 foot pipe, and that for quite a while was uh, the Rondout Creek. Eventually when they got the dam up high enough, then the creek ran through a hole, and you'll see that. The individuals that did the work, the so-called muckers, they received about $1.20 to $1.60 a day. Uh, that doesn't seem like much money now, but that was better than individuals were getting if they worked on a farm. And these individuals worked on the first project, as far as I know, public works project, that um, the workers worked an eight-hour day. If you worked on a local farm, you got a dollar a day, and you worked from dawn till, uh, till dusk. But these chaps uh, worked very, very hard for a long period of time. And finally, they got down to bedrock, and the dam could, uh, could begin to, to, to uh, be produced, to be, be made. Uh, when you look at the dam from the water side or you look over, over the top, if you're walking on the dam as you can do now, the dam looks like it, uh, it only goes downhill. But uh, the point that's underwater is, is pretty much the same as the one that goes down. It was built sort of like a pyramid. It, it, the, the construction um, was called Cyclopean Masonry. Uh, I don't think engineers called it that, but that's what it was called in the papers. And, uh, essentially, it meant a combination of packed earth, um, um, uh, concrete, cement, uh, which, which came locally. It was mined locally, much of it in Rosendale. They used uh, about a million and a half barrels, big, big barrels uh, of concrete. And then they would drop uh, large chunks of bluestone in it from the local quarries, particularly the Yale quarry, which I'll show you in a little while, to, to build the dam. Uh, the dam is held now for over a hundred years, so maybe uh, maybe uh, uh, A.T. Clearwater's fears have, have at least yet not been uh, somehow proven to be true. Uh, but the dam does leak. I'm sure you're aware of that. A anyway, um, here is the dam site in the early days. Uh, the technology again seems very primitive to us, but in those days it was uh, what might be called state of the art. Uh, you see the uh, four Lingerwed de derricks, and there would be four behind us, that could swing very, very heavy materials out over the dam as it was being built. And, uh, and to the right, uh, a uh, so-called McCullough crusher that would uh, crush stone and things of that sort. It was a fairly advanced camp, and we'll talk about that too in a minute. But the, uh, the machinery, again, looks primitive, like this uh, projector that I'm using. 
but it was very effective. The contract for the dam and the dikes were, was $2.7 million. There was some argument about it because there was a lower bid, but they found out that that company had no experience and that in the bid they had bid really way too low. So um, ultimately that's what it was built for. And the dam was generally speaking built on time and pretty much uh, uh, for what they said it was going to cost. Um, here's uh, one of those wonderful steam shovels, a true steam shovel, uh, and it's running on tracks. Uh, out where the reservoir would be built, and the water would rise, there were, there were blue stone quarries and shale pits and stone bits. I mean, the, the glacier had gone through this area so many times that uh, building materials really were uh, pretty much on site. Uh, they also used, in addition to the, the steam shovels, uh, they also used what were called eagle wagons, and you'll see them in a big line on the right. They were brought from the south by uh, Winston and Company. Winston was a southerner. I'll tell you more about him in a minute. And uh, he hired many African Americans who came and worked on the site, and primarily they worked as drovers, um, mule, mule tiers, I guess you would say. There were these very large mules that would pull these wagons, and the bottoms of the wagons would drop out so that they could pull over something open the bottom up and it was sort of like a dump truck uh, to some extent. So there was a combination of all kinds of uh, uh, a technology being used at that time. This I thought you might find of interest because now it's the next stage and you'll notice that the, the big pipe that uh, the Esopus Creek went through uh, is no longer there and there's a hole in the dam. So now the Esopus Creek is running back uh, in its whole stream bed by and large and they can continue with the work. The footing's finished and they're starting to build the major part of the dam. So this would probably be about uh, 1909 or so, you know, that, that era. We're looking to the south. You can see the derricks there that we talked about before. And also you can see in the, um, in the upper right-hand corner the front face of High Point Mountain but also between that, there's a big hill there, and that's Acorn Hill, and that's where the Yale Quarry was, where most of the major stone came. It was picked up by a train, and the train went way around. You'll see the bridge later on, and it went over to the dam, and that's where the stone was dropped off. And you can see that they're blasting in the quarry. You can see the smoke coming up from this different area. And you, you, you can walk over and see the quarry now, this huge quarry, even though it's overgrown. One more shot, do two now, down downstream, you see the, the soap is going through. Um, clearly it isn't too high water yet, but uh, uh, that will happen in a, a little bit later on. Uh, the man who, who built the dam, as they say, who was the uh, major partner in um, Winston and Company was named James O. Winston. Um, he, he was an interesting chap. He, he was a, 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 a big good-looking, dynamic man. Um, they said he liked uh, uh, beautiful horses and, and big cigars and, uh, you know, he was very expansive. Uh, he was great organizationally, but um, he, he really was no mechanic or, or engineer at all, really. Uh, the anecdote goes that if you, if you handed him a screwdriver, he didn't know which end to use. Uh, but um, but he was um, able to marshal large forces of human beings from different parts of the country and the world and to get the project done. And he was um, able to do that. He spent the latter part of his life after doing many other projects. He worked on the subway in New York City and so on. Uh, he, sp he spent the latter part of his life in retirement in Saugerties. Um, uh, his farm was the site of the second Woodstock Festival. You prob probably know that. It was said that uh, when, uh, when he was a young man and went to work on the Ohio Railroad because his parents and his family that had lived in Virginia, um, they lost everything in the Civil War. His father was a colonel in the Civil War. So this chap's maybe kind of a southern gentleman, but they had no money anymore. So he and his brother Tom went to work on the Ohio Railroad, and they said that he would take the dynamite to bed with him at night so that it would be warm in the morning and they could start work right away. Of course, there was a camp at the reservoir, um, at the dam. You see the dam now. This is in the latter stages, and you'll also see the, the, the water going up. So this is post 
uh, this is probably 1914, maybe late 13, 1914. Um, we talk about the camp at the dam, and uh, it was a little bit to the north of the dam and then into what, what's today woods all around there, but it wasn't a camp. There were many camps. Uh, the workers came from uh, all over the country, and uh, we'll talk more about that too in a minute, but um, there, was ra there, there were racial tensions. Um, there, were, there were national issues. World War I was on the way and then started near the end of it. Um, and so there were many camps, but this was the main camp, which um, it, it cost about a million and a half dollars to build it. it. It was like nothing else in the Catskills. It had, uh, it had electricity and, and, and running water and, and go, you know, garbage pickup and, and uh, you know, commissary, all sorts of things. Uh, it, the, 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 there was a big plant, which you saw a few minutes ago, that, that produced uh, compressed air that the machinery was operated on. There was a post office. That area was called Brown Station, as you, as you know, and it still is. There was a post office, a bank, a, a fire department. Uh, this was the bakery. There was a commissary which was of great fascination to locals. It was sort of like going to the mall. They, they could find things there that they couldn't find any place else, you know. They, there was pasta that was there and, and uh, you know, kinds of clothing and everything. It was run, of course, by, by Winston and Company, and the prices were a little bit higher, but it was uh, goods that, uh, you know, you couldn't get any place else around this part of the country because locals were, uh, workers on the project and they were introduced to people from uh, you know all over the world that worked there. There was a hospital too which uh, I am told had 23 beds. beds. Where they fit them in that building I don't know but um, that's where you went if you were injured. Uh, you can see the operating table on the lower left hand side of this photograph and some, uh, s some, some views of some of the uh, the dormitories that they stayed in. About 86% of the workers at Ashokan lived in dormitories and came from elsewhere. Uh, on average, they had about a fifth, fifth grade education. Uh, I think I told you what they got paid and you know that sort of thing. There were schools, there was a church with an Irish priest. Uh, here's, here's the school for locals and here's the school for uh, foreigners and uh, people of color and so on as we used to say. And if you were an engineer, you could buy the use of a house. You buy it and then maybe sell it back, I'm not sure, for $400. And many of the engineers who came from uh, Virginia, they came up like the African Americans with, um, with Winston. Uh, they would buy these houses and they would live in them for the, the length of the project, which for some of them would be about 10 years. The engineers were um, great uh, great favorites of local girls. Uh, I remember interviewing years ago when I did the book um, a woman who was over 100 years old and she had married one of the engineers and I said, why did you, why did you marry somebody like that from uh, Virginia or whatever? And she said, they were very classy. They were very classy. And of course, a lot of people um, lived in uh, sort of makeshift uh, substandard housing around, uh, around the project. The, the young chaps who worked on the dam, and here's one of the uh, you know, picnics they had probably on Fourth of July or something like that. And no, notice the faces. I mean, they're just stunning. Each one of them you want to frame. Here's, here's another shot, too. You see them a little bit better. Uh, they came from 27 states of the United States uh, and from many, many countries in Europe. Uh, to a great extent, though, they came from Italy, from Austria, and from Russia, but there were Poles and there were Swedes and there were English people and you know, so many. Uh, they worked hard. Uh, they they were um, not infrequently injured. They they would fall off things or get scalded, or or uh, uh, you, you know maybe maybe be in in some way uh, uh, injured by one of the machines that they worked. Um, Elwin Davis who you'll see near the end, uh, was driving one of, the, one of those large um, um, machines that we saw at the very beginning, and he caught his hand in it. It was a steamroller, and it crushed his hand. 
and they took him to the hospital. Every, everybody that worked on the project uh, gave 20 cents, was taken 20 cents a week, was taken out of their pay for, for medical care, and he was taken there. And he told me, he said, as he was going under the ether, he heard the doctor say to the nurse, maybe one of those two nurses out front, uh, he heard the doctor say, well, I guess maybe I can make some kind of a hook out of it. The most common uh, disease uh, in the project was malaria, which is interesting. Um, there was a, a violence at, at the camps, not, not as much as you would think, but uh, uh, enough so uh, in, in articles of the time they would talk about the Catskill Reign of Terror, which is interesting. A chap named Carmody, who was a sergeant, wrote about that. And uh, it was necessary to establish a police force, which they did. And they, they patrolled uh, from a show can all the way down the, the pipeline, all the way down the aqueduct towards New York City. There were three or four hundred of them. Uh, but, but one of the things which is particularly interesting about that is that that became the, the core or the basis for the American, or the, excuse me, the New York State Police Force, who are, uh, I believe, uh, observing their 100th anniversary, their centennial, very soon. So it was uh, a show can that provided the basis for uh, the, the state police. Uh, in, in, the, in some 10 years or so that they were uh, on the project, from about 2008 to 18 or so, they were responsible for some 5,000 convictions. About 300 people died on the project uh, from a show can all the way down the aqueduct to New York, most of them on the aqueduct and most of them in projects where they were digging underground. Um, but when you think about it, that's not very much for the population. That was about maybe half of what the death rate was in New York City at the time. A uh, wonderful shot here of the project, the dam, and so on uh, in, uh, in the winter. They worked as long as they could uh, until the weather made it impossible, and they started as soon as they could, uh, as, as you might, uh, might imagine. Uh, one of the most interesting parts of the project, and this continued during the winter months, was conducted by uh, another contractor, probably the second most important one after Winston, uh, and his name was Joseph T. Rice. Rice was an Irishman. Uh, he was an orphan. He was born and raised in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, in a, a Christian Brothers orphanage. Uh, he, he was only uh, uh, self-educated, uh, but he was a voracious reader, and in his later life, when he married and lived for a while here in, in Olive Bridge, uh, he made sure that all of his sons and all of his daughters went to college, which he was not able to do. He was also a dynamic chap, and he was responsible for the clearing of the basins, of the two basins. And uh, it was an awesome <laughs> prospect when you think about it. Uh, it, it was uh, uh, of the 15,000 acres that the city was able to buy to make the two basins, um, it, it was uh, about maybe, oh, I'd say roughly 12,000 of those acres that he had to clear and grub. Much of it was, was done by hand, but some of the larger trees were pulled out by machines like this that, um, you know, you could hook to the tree and it would pull a stump out, that, that sort of thing. But as you'll see in a few minutes, uh, when, uh, when he and his crews were done, there was nothing there. They also had to do what was called mucking. Uh, they mucked maybe about 2,000 acres of the 15,000, but that was where they not only took out all the roots as well as cut the trees down and so on, but they cleaned up all of those farms, all of the barnyards, all of the privies, any sort of uh, fecal, you know, uh, any, any kind of matter of that sort had to be dug out and removed. And here you'll see a crew working uh, in, in that respect. Trees of a certain size were cut down, but then left. And I'm sure if you've seen the reservoir in drought time, you'll still see some of the stumps of those trees there. They found for their testing that the soil was, um, uh, I can't think of the right word technically, obviously, but uh, it, it was not going to foam up as much as they thought. So they didn't have to do quite as much as, uh, as it was originally an anticipated. But you think about cutting down every living thing 
and digging up every little thing uh, for 12,000 acres, it's, it's daunting, you know. Anyway, they also, um, they burned, of course, many buildings, but a, a lot of them were sold and moved. And I just want to show you two, probably the two of the most interesting ones. This uh, a photograph taken just before the building of the reservoir was of D.N. Matthews' um, a grocery store, general store. It was the largest general store, so this was sort of like, you know, going to the mall again in the area. It was in West Shokan, the largest community. Uh, D.N. Matthews later on took his settlement and uh, um, built a bank in, in, in Kingston and it became a prominent family there too. But this had to go, but this one they actually moved and you can see it anytime you want to see it. It's somewhat altered, but uh, uh, Supervisor Stanley probably knows it's, uh, it's up in Phoenicia on the main street. When I took this photograph years ago when I was doing the research, it was McGrath's Market. But uh, now it's something else. It's been a bunch of other things. But um, that was one of the buildings that was moved. And um, many, many of the buildings along Route 28 particularly and very definitely in places like uh, uh, Phoenicia, which was an established community, but it was not within the take line, uh, they're, they're there. And, and probably the most famous uh, move was of the Methodist Episcopal Church, which is on the base of Ohio Mountain Road that goes up and over the mountain to Woodstock from Route 28. Now it's an artist's uh, studio, I believe. But in its day, it was down where old Shokan used to be. It was in Shokan, which was across the Asopus Creek from, uh, from West Shokan. There was a bridge there. And uh, the story goes, it's kind of interesting, that uh, the congregation uh, was paid for the church, and it was owned, therefore, by the city of New York, but they hadn't done anything with it. And so they went to, uh, to uh, uh, Kirkendall, the head of the railroad, and uh, they said, we understand this is on your property. And he said, uh, yeah, I guess it is if you say it is. And they said, well, will you sell it to us? And he said, I'll give it to you. You know, he was a church guy. So um, he said, but you got to move it. You got to get out of here fast. So they did. They got oxen and so on. A fellow named Chris Bell was involved, Stoutenberg, a lot of local people. And they actually moved it here. But then when the city found out about it, they said it was our land. And when they resurveyed it, they found that about a fifth of it was on the railroad property, but about, uh, you know, four-fifths of it was on the city property. So it went to court, and everybody was shocked. You know, how can you sue a church for their own building? And uh, the, the court found in favor of New York, but um, New York was only given $45 in, uh, in damages. So they got their church for 45 bucks. That's a pretty good deal. The other thing that had to be done, in addition to clearing out the, uh, the outhouses and, and, and all the uh, material that was in the, the barns and things of that sort, was um, to exhume the bodies. And as you may know, um, there were more dead people in the town. This has been said about the Catskills from time to time. There were more dead people in the town, uh, buried, you know, the remains of them, than there were living people. About 2,000 living people were moved but uh, nearly about 2,800 bodies were moved. And of those 2,800 bodies, uh, roughly 400, a little bit less than that, but about four of them, 400 of them were unclaimed. Nobody ever claimed the bodies. Um, the, the contractors, and there were many of them, who did the, the exhumations throughout the, uh, the basins, these some you know, 12 miles or so of territory, 24 square miles, uh, they were locals and uh, local undertakers. They were subcontractors through the city. And uh, they were paid $15 to, to remove the remains in, in a small box. Usually, if they were old graves, it would be about a foot high, maybe in three feet long. And uh, to move them wherever the... Uh, the people who claimed them, their relatives said they wanted them moved. Many of them went to West Hurley, Woodstock, New West Hurley, to, to Hurley, to, to uh, Kingston, the Montrepose Cemetery, and places like that. But there were about 400 people that nobody claimed, and there were no names left on the gravestones. So they were called the unknown. And roughly those 400 people were, 
what was left of them, some instances very little, were taken and they were buried in uh, a number of cemeteries around the area, out, uh, out Rock City Road in, in Woodstock, um, in Hurley, in the old Hurley Cemetery off the old, old Route 209, a couple of other places. This, this one that I photographed quite a few years ago uh, was um, in the Moon Hall. It's a, a little teeny uh, private cemetery. And, and a section, as in Hurley and all these other places in Woodstock, was set aside for these people. And they were buried there. Each one had a gravestone, as you can see, that was about a foot by a foot above ground. And uh, on it would be um, two letters, like A and A or A and B or whatever. And that indicated where they had been taken from in the reservoir. But there was no other information known about them. This one you can go and see. Uh, it's just off the Moonhaw Road. But they're in Hurley and other places. And it's one of the touching aspects of the reservoir and one that, you know, we don't think about. It wasn't just people that were moved and farms that were taken. It was their grandparents and, and, and so on. And, and it was a source of, of anger for a long, long time. God help us, here it is. So when all the bodies were taken out, they were taken first from about 1909 to 1911 while the dam was building built, being built. And then uh, all the land was cleared in two years from 1912 to after the water started to, to rise uh, in 1914. The water rose, of course, as you know, in September. And uh, this is what the upper basin looked like in the last days. You'll notice they're still doing some blasting. In some instances they blasted uh, um, big stumps out or you know some material that they just couldn't get out. You'll notice there's only one house left, which would be demolished very soon. We're looking towards the high peak, towards the, the Burroughs Range, to the west, towards Boyceville, from the dam. The, the, the person who took this photograph was clearly standing on the south end of the dam, where Route 28A is, and so on. And you'll notice, looking if you follow the stream up, that's the Esopus, and that's the gorge which goes by here. Uh, you'll see uh, Bishop's Falls but there's nothing else left there, you know, that sort of thing. You'll see the, the, the puff of smoke, and you'll see where the train went. This was a, a train that was put in uh, by, uh, by Winston and Company, a little dinky train, and that went around, like, to the left and towards High Point. You, you can still see the abutments if you go up uh, Sampsonville Road from Route 28A there on the corner, and it, it swung around, and it took the train into the El Quarry, then it came around uh, to the bottom of the uh, where we're standing, and uh, you know, dumped things off at the at the dam itself. But there's nothing there. You can see the bridge. It was a temporary bridge put up by Winston up above on uh, the Esopus Creek. Uh, when when I interviewed all these people who who were alive when I started to work on the book in the 1970s, um, I, I asked. I asked Harlow, you'll see Harlow in a minute. I guess I've got uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, I asked Harlow what it was like, you know, when it was all cleared. Because this, this, these were 500 houses and 1,500 buildings and 2,000 people and stores and shops. And it was a contained community. I mean, people did, they only went to Kingston rarely on the railroad. Um, they all worked for each other or sold things to each other and so on. So I said to Harlow, what was it like? And he said, it was like the end of the earth. Like the end of the earth. Great big man. You'll see him in a minute. And, and I said, um, what do you mean? And he said, well, it, it was like a cleared field. I can still remember him saying it, and Harlow's been dead a long time. It was a clear field all the way from the dam to Boyceville. He said there was nothing. There was nothing. In other words, nothing that he ever remembered. Nothing that he ever remembered. Like Sherman going through Georgia, right? Now here's the dam. It's, it's, it's plugged up. Of course, we're looking towards the north. right? You see most of the machinery is gone. They still have to finish the facing and the roads and that was all done just like the clearing was done. They did the clearing last of course because if they had started the clearing at the beginning of the project it would have all grown up. 
you know, so anyway, that's why they did that. And you see a couple of people up there on the dam and whatever, but um, the project is, uh, at least this part of it, is, is almost over. But I wanted to show you anyway how they filled it up. You know, often people sort of ask me, did they use a cork, you know, or something of that sort. But n no, they didn't. Uh, it was in September. The, the rains had start, started, you know, that, that come in the fall, and uh, the water was low, and they just ran that in, and they started to fill it up 150 feet on the other end and worked back, and, and it was finished by... Uh, early September of 1913. You can see how high the dam is. You can see how it sloped. And they just started at one end and worked back. And of course, when it was finally filled, uh, you know, September 13, 1913, the water started to rise. And you can begin to see it. If you look, look to the left of the, um, of the derrick and the power station is still there, it hasn't been taken down, you can see the water's actually coming up. You can see that white pattern in there, that sort of thing. Um, at, at first, it, it was relatively slow in filling, uh, and and people, you know, sort of made fun of the contractor and the city, and they said, well, you know, you didn't glue it right, and there are holes in the in the floor, and it's you're going to have to go to uh, Sears and Roebuck, you know, and buy some glue or something like that. Uh, but then, of course, as is always the case, or usually the case, once we got into October, November, it rained like heck. And, uh, and it filled, at least they only filled the West Basin first. It probably filled within uh, a couple of months. And then everything that everybody had ever known was gone. Here's the reservoir, probably shot taken 20, 30 years ago. Who knows how long, but I took it. Um, and you could see it's pretty much full, 500 some odd feet, 60 or something above, above uh, sea level. We're looking towards the north, towards uh, Tanchi, Teistanaik, Woodstock, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, underneath that was uh, a way of life. Here's another shot looking towards the west, towards High Point from the gatehouses. Probably one of the most beautiful reservoirs in the world, but also a place where people lived and made their life. Well, once it was finished, it became uh, not only a source of potable water for New York City, uh, but it also became uh, a tourist attraction. And it still is to some extent. People like to go and drive along. This is the Middle Dyke. They used to call it the Boulevard. Even John Burroughs did it in a Model T Ford and he was probably one of the worst drivers in the world. Uh, when Henry Ford, his buddy, gave him a Ford, um, they parked it in his uh, shed up in Roxbury at Woodcheck Lodge and gave Burroughs some directions and he got in the car and put it in reverse and smashed out through the back of the barn. And I talked to some old people around here and they said whenever Burroughs came around in his car, everybody got their kids and chickens and took them off the road. They were afraid of what was going to happen. But of course, it brings us back, now we're done, just about, to the city. And uh, that's where the interest went. Once the dam was finished and the paving done and everything else, uh, it took about two years before water got to New York, 1915, during the Christmas vacation. And then two years later, in 1917, um, they had a civic uh, celebration and, uh, you know, to a great extent, uh, Ashokan was forgotten about. And they went on to other projects to build uh, the, the, the great reservoir in Schoharie and down in Rondout and things of that sort. This is that celebration in 1917 when uh, Mayor Mitchell turned on the water and uh, there it was, you know, and everybody said, Yahoo. But up here, there were folks who uh, had lost their homes and their way of life and their jobs and things of that sort. And, I just wanted to, you in the last four minutes that I have now, I wanted to give you a chance to see them. On the left is uh, Ellen Davis. He's the man who lost his hand working, uh, you know, on the dam. Uh, in the middle is his wife, Ollie. She was a burger uh, from West Shokan, right near. She grew up right near where that uh, cemetery is that we saw. And on the far right, 
uh, um, uh, in somewhat diminutive fashion, uh, is, uh, is Harlow McLean. It's sort of interesting. McLean, Davis, English, uh, Ali Berger, German, Dutch, those were the people that settled this part of the country with French Huguenots. Um, anyway, just in the last three minutes, I guess, that I have, I wanted to sing a song to you that Elwin taught me. I, I spent the last three years of Elwin's life um, learning about this project. And uh, as you probably know, if you've read my book, he is one of the three people who I dedicated to. Ellen was called Squire. Uh, he was a man of great dignity. He was a fine writer, and uh, he sort of chronicled the whole thing. Anyway, Ellen told me about uh, all these dinners that the, uh, the engineers who worked on the dam uh, used to, to have in, in hotels. And they would make up songs, uh, words to songs of the day. And uh, one of them was called the Board of Water Supply Boating Song. And the Board of Water Supply had a boat that went out and picked up trash, you know, from, that would float down, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it's a play on uh, Adam and uh, Adam and Eve and, uh, you know, that sort of thing in the flood and uh, Noah. No, I guess it's Noah, not Adam and Eve. But anyway, it's called the Board of Water Supply Boating Song. I'm going to try to sing it just the way Elwin sang it get you his voice too so I got two minutes I think I can do it oh Noah put himself in ark the dear old, old Noah <laughs> well I got it a dear old Christian soul put all his folks aboard and left his neighbors in a hole Old Noah pushed out in the stream with all his kith and kin. The neighbors stood upon the bank and cheerily said to him, this is like the dam's not going to fill, the reservoir's not going to fill. Go to hell now, go to hell now, go to hell right now with your damn old scow. It ain't going to rain anyhow, anyhow. It ain't going to rain anyhow. But of course, in the fall, as you know, it did rain and the reservoir did fill. So this is Noah saying, for 40 days and 40 nights, the rain came down like hell. The water filled steam thousand feet over every hill and dell. Old Noah walking round the ark stood, <laughs> looked out a window pane and said, now where are those poor damn fools who said it wouldn't rain? Thank you, Thank you very much. water was brought to the city was practically one of the seven wonders because uh, it, it was just by uh, flowing straight downhill and it didn't need any kind of transportation. You're right. The water goes from a show can to, to New York, Hillview, some, or Hillview Reservoir and so on, by gravity and siphon. That's right. Why did it take two months for the water to reach New York City? Well, they, for, for they closed up the dam in September 1913, right? And it took about two months to fill the upper basin. It didn't look like it was going to fill at all, but then it did. It started to rain. That's what the song is about. I forgot to tell you. Forgive me. But um, they, they tested it. They say wasted water. I mean, I'm, I'm saying this to a, <laughs> a house full of water people, so forgive me. But they tested it for years. Right, and the and the aqueduct was not finished for quite some time, right? So so water that could be used in Manhattan didn't reach there for two years, but uh, probably they could have gotten him, and it just took that long. Could you please explain the difference between a dam and a dike, and where they're located? Because sure. and the one in West Turley and the one in right here. Right, the the uh, contract three for 
2.7 million dollars to Winston and Company was they had other contracts too but that was to build the dam the main dam and the dikes the main dam and the dikes are a total of about five and a half miles long you know we put them all together there's only one dam and that's the one that was right below where Bishop's Falls was in what today we call Olive Bridge you know that's that sort of thing and that dam is I don't I don't know exactly how long it is but it's not even a mile long but on from from there all the way to West Hurley Woodstock Glenford right they had to build dikes and and the dikes were not all concrete they're mainly packed earth and stone in them and so on you know that sort of thing and they many of them the, the Woods, Woodstock dike the West Hurley dike leaked for years they couldn't stop them from from going uh, you know from leaking but but um, usually when you think of a dike you think of of packed earth rammed earth you know and other things too but the dam is is a lot of concrete you know and that's what that's what that's what plugs up the Esopus Creek that's what made it that gorge in the creek the Esopus Creek and all the feeder streams whatever but um, the dikes are what people walk on primarily today the middle dike runs runs from the gatehouses down to the frying pan where there's parking and then there are other dikes you know West Early Dike and Glenford Dike and on and on and on if they didn't have those dikes the water would, would, you know, would be stopped by the dam, but then it would start going off the other end. So they really needed about five miles worth of dikes to, to keep the water in. And uh, uh, initially, the water didn't come. And then when it came, it came so fast because of the heavy storms. And it went right through the holes that they still had in the dike. Brown Station was flooded. You mentioned that the, uh, the dam leaks. Is that because of the flood? No, I don't think so, and, and I'm not really um, knowledgeable to tell you why. But, but you'll notice when you go downstream, there's still water there. And that's probably to some extent, you know, if you drive below the dam, there's a new road that's been put through down through there. But you, you can look up and you see there's water, and it's always been there. I, I, maybe it's seepage. Uh, I, I can't say. I'm, I'm really uh, n not knowledgeable of that.